community and build revolutionary organization. For that reason, the chairman has been known as the last man standing. And at this time, I want all of y'all to stand up right now. And 
I was thinking about that uh, when Comrade Dia uh, was speaking because he's not the man he was a few years ago. Uh, when he first came, he was uh, enthusiastic and he was really, uh, it was really important because he had uh, all the contradictions that, uh, that come with youth. You know, uh, because young people know every damn thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And young people have so much energy, and that's really important. It's really the important enthusiasm that young people have, but they also, young people do have youth too, and, and that's a contradiction of sorts. Uh, but Dia has come to represent uh, much of what this campaign that he, he spoke about, the one people, one party, one destiny campaign that we've initiated in our, in our organization subsequent to the fifth party of Congress, uh, the Congress, the fifth party of Congress, because we're not satisfied with the vast majority of Africans and other people in this country and around the world being followers of liberals and sellouts, reactionaries, neo-colonial forces. We're not satisfied. We don't accept this world as it is at all. We don't think that this is all that it is to offer and that what we have to do is simply find a way to make it better, to find a better way to live in this. We say that there's something profoundly wrong about this social system and that it, it has to go and that it's our responsibility and task to make it disappear, to organize masses of people, to bring them into political life, to destroy a social system that's based on misery and <coughs> can't produce anything but misery for the vast majority of the people. And uh, so Comrade Dia uh, was someone who really struck us as a, as a person who wanted to, to engage in this work and we were glad to see him and, and uh, he is what we define as cadre. We said that our objective is to, is to our objective, our objective coming out of that Congress Notwithstanding uh, the fact that there are not a lot of us as such, there were not a lot of us who stood up in, in 2008 when, when Obama came through here and uh, bringing his, uh, his, his play act to Gibbs High School uh, when he stood there with his black self uh, uh, standing up for white power. There were not a lot of us. When we were not satisfied with the fact that he just had black skin. Yeah. <laughs> That's not enough. Because our people are suffering. We were struggling at that very moment with police murder right here in the streets where they had murdered one young African coming from a graduation party, shot him in the back. And then walked away from it, doing it with impunity like they murder people all around the world. We're not satisfied with that situation. And so when we said Obama is coming here, and he's going to have this thing at Gibbs High School. We're going there. And we're going to take this campaign that being waged against this, our people into that campaign that he's bringing in, in defense of imperialism. And what's going to be the slogan? We've got to come up with something that captures everything. You know, there are a lot of profound questions that you can think about. But the simplest, most profound question that we could ask was what about the black community? Now here you are with your black self talk. What about the black community? We saw you on your belly crawling down in Miami before the Jewish population uh, uh, trying to win what could be won there. What about the black community? We see you making promises to everybody around the world. What about the black community? That's all we said. And when he did it, there were just a handful of us. And we said to Obama, what about the black community? That's the first time I saw Obama, Obama stutter. <laughs> the first time I saw him stutter. And of course, he controlled the microphone. We didn't control the mic, he controlled the mic. So it wasn't an opportunity to really engage him in a debate, but what you saw happen was there was an uproar uh, in that building. And the Africans were condemning and, and upset with the fact that we would ask this Negro about black people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and then the, uh, the response from around the country was so, so heavy that it shut down our computer system. The internet shut down so many people from around the country, and most of them called to attack us. 
Yes. You understand? We were a minority. Yeah. So the objective, however, is that we recognize that leadership is needed. And so, you know, leadership is not waiting until everybody agrees with you to do something. Right now. Because if everybody agrees with something, you don't need leadership. Do you? you don't need leadership if everybody agrees with something. And so, uh, uh, we stood up and raised that question. And so, it was just a handful of us at the moment. And we've been struggling since the inception of NPDOM. Before it was NPDOM either, but when it was the People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, organized in Oakland, California in 1989. Because what had happened was, we were a part of a proud revolutionary movement and a proud revolutionary tradition. In this country, African people are. We've never been on the side of warmongering and hate and terror being waged against the people of the world. And we will not be dragged in that direction by Obama or anybody like Obama. You, you can't be black enough to turn us against our own interests. And we know that our interest is the same as that as of the vast majority of the people on this planet. Not the banksters here or in Antwerp or some other places around the world. We stand with the people of, around this world. We, are, uh, we said we gotta have cadre. People who can do not just one DR. There's been many people who can take that kind of stand. Who can build a revolutionary movement who just won't go the way of least resistance. Yeah. Which is what many of us have been doing for the longest period of time. So, but he wasn't always like that. He was the person that Howard Cosell's wife was complaining about, wasn't he? <laughs> he wasn't always like that, you know, when we met him. Uh, but what has happened is that just to watch this development of this comrade. And so if there's something to do, Diop will do it. Diop will do it. If it can be done, Diop will do it. He doesn't say, well, I don't have enough time. Oh, I'm kind of sick, man. Uh, uh, you know, if, if he doesn't feel well, he, he'll put a nice uh, thing on his head and then stagger out the door to get the task done for the people. Because he knows. We're talking about, we're talking about revolutionary cadre. We're talking about building the kind of organization that you must have if you're talking about being free. There's never been an oppressed people on the planet Earth that wants freedom without first creating an organization of steel cadre. Forces who are willing to do everything or anything in order to win their freedom. You've got to have that if you're going to have freedom. Yes. If you're playing, you don't need that. <laughs> if you're part of the Glee Club, you don't have to be like that to be a part of the Glee Club or the NAACP yeah. uh, or the All African People's Revolutionary Party. But that's what you have to be if you're interested in making a revolution. So we, in 1970, in 1989, we built this, this organization, the People's Democratic World Movement, because we had suffered a, a magnificent defeat, our revolution had. Assassinations had become the order of the day, because the imperialists could not engage in us with the debate where they didn't control the microphone. If they didn't control the microphone, they could not control, engage in the debate. Obama would have stood a chance if they could have had this discussion without somebody else, the white people controlling that microphone, that would have been a real interesting kind of discussion. Because you haven't seen a debate happening on this stuff that you talk, saw that with Obama and, uh, and the white guy who was running against him. There was no debate there. They didn't talk about the police murders, the numbers of Africans in these prisons, the drone strikes murdering innocent, innocent people around the world. They didn't talk about the more than one million Africans who are locked up in prisons inside this United States. They didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about what the United States is doing in Congo, or, or Haiti, or various places around the world. None of that got, that was no debate. That was no debate. They can't handle the debate. Yeah. And so in the 1960s, what we saw was a, a debate was waging throughout this country and throughout the world. And we weren't the only people who were engaged in this debate. Che Guevara was involved in this debate. Yeah. We had people like Fidel Castro involved, and Kuma and Lumumba, these people were involved in this debate about what this world was going to look like, what was wrong with this world. Walter Rodney was involved in this debate. 
And they, so were we inside this country. Fred Hampton was involved in this debate, the Black Revolution, and they could not handle this debate. And we defeated them politically and ideologically. Africans had turned our backs to this system, created our own parties, looked for our own freedoms. And in the face of the masses turning their backs on imperialism and defeating them ideologically and politically, the U.S. turned to the only weapon that it had at its disposal, and that was the gun. And so throughout this country and throughout the world, assassinations became the order of the day. We know what they did with King. They, they hardly act like they didn't kill him. They, they murdered King. They murdered Malcolm X. They got help in each instance from somebody inside, but they always do have help from the inside. But they murdered those people. They murdered Che Guevara. They had wounded and captured Che Guevara, and after doing so, murdered him. And of course, made him much bigger than he ever could have been, had he stayed alive. So they crushed out a revolutionary movement and criminal overthrown. The moon were murdered. Anybody who stood up for the happiness and well-being of the masses of people around the world were put under the gun. We don't even know how many people during the 1960s actually were killed. They killed Carl Hampton in Houston, Texas, People Party number two. We don't know how many people they arrested in the 1960s. Massive sweeps happened throughout this country. And they removed that from the memory of the people today. People who come in the struggle and movement today have no idea about what happened then. And that's important, because I'm not standing here waxing nostalgic about the 1960s. The reason that it's important is because it was the high tide of revolutionary struggle. It was a time where we had cracked the shell of imperialism and every pride, and imperialism was on the run on every front. They were only leaping off buildings to get out of Vietnam on those helicopters as fast as they were. They were fighting ground battles in Detroit. Armed struggle in Detroit and various other places around this country. So that was an imperialism that was on the run. And it was able to crush this resistance in the most brutal way. And then to remove from people's memory the whole idea of the resistance. What used to be black power that they opposed. And all the Uncle Tom Negroes, reactionary, neo-colonial puppet Negroes, liberals, opposed black power as well. And then after killing the revolutionaries and jailing the revolution, they raised up a whole new sector in our communities around the world and say, this represents black power. This is your black power now. Wilson Good was black power. Wilson Good in Philadelphia was black power. He ends up dropping the bomb that kills 11 men and women, men and children, destroys six or some odd houses in the entire African community, but they call him black power. After they had killed and jail people who stood for the power of our folk. You see, that's what happened in Kenya. They, that's, in fact, we saw with Kenya and Wilson Good, the, 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 we saw with Wilson Good and, and Nutter, who was mentioned here from Philadelphia. Uh, I just saw Nutter in a movie just the other day. You know, uh, this is guy's the, the Negro male. He's the, the ugly face you see when you get off the airplane in Philadelphia, you come down the airport and you have this thing. But that's, that's him. <laughs> Got the <D-out> job. <laughs> but these, these forces represent neo-colonialism. And, and so uh, they removed the memory of the revolution. And I'm talking about the time, when we talk about revolution, what are we talking about? <laughs> We're not talking about somebody running down the street, running, yelling, run, run, Jesse, run. <laughs> Unless they got a brick in their hand. <laughs> you know? We're not talking about somebody who can go, I can vote now. You know, if we don't, if it's not Obama, who is it going to be? What kind of ridiculous stuff is that? You know, like fighting over chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, 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 and that's what it, what it really represents. It was a revolutionary movement. They, the ruling class, I remember this, this magazine that was associated with the CIA and the mind of a lot of people, probably true. U.S. World News Report. 
1966, I think it was. In, in the 1960s, they did a poll in the African community and asking Africans whether they were revolutionaries or not. And 10% of the Africans in this country said they were revolutionaries. And they didn't even have black reporters doing the poll. These are white people running around asking if you're a revolutionary. 10% say yes, that's profound enough right there. 10% of the population said they're revolutionary, and they told the white folks that. If the 10% said it, 44% didn't tell them the truth. This was a this was a hell of a period. You must understand this. That's why we talk about the sixties. Because it was a revolutionary period and it had to be struck down. It didn't happen here. It happened all around the world. Chinese said that revolution was the main train in the entire world. And so they came gunning for us. And they killed off a lot of us. They jailed a lot of us. And then they put these open times in place. And they put drugs in our community. I said they put drugs in our community. You know, uh, the, 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 the heroin. And then subsequent to that, then came with the crack cocaine. And I know that there are people even in this room who don't believe it. They don't believe this a conspiracy theory. They would say the United States government, they wouldn't put drugs in the community. No, they would sell your gun on my slave, but they wouldn't put drugs, they wouldn't sell drugs. That's the most insane thing. But let me tell you more than that. That the capitalism is what it is that we're looking at. It is a social system. That, that, that comes from the source of history. It is a social system that was brought forth in, in guts and, and slavery and the immiseration of the vast majority of the people on this earth. It is a system that was born from slavery and colonialism and drug pushing. You may have read just a few months ago of a big bank in England, HSBC, Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank Corporation. Did you know that that bank was founded in the 1800s to handle the opium trade? They talk about it. it it's involved uh, somehow in, uh, what do they call it? They call it money laundering, drug money laundering. Hell, they're the pushers. They're the pushers, the banks, Chase Manhattan. The
General Alexander Haig. So that's the statement exactly what kind of what kind of foreign policy you're gonna be looking at. The general was made, and, and, and Haig said in his first policy statement, from this point on, out of these things that have been called liberation struggles out of the world, what did he say they were gonna be called? Terrorism. 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 That's why Liam Stewart is locked up in part today because the government has defined that anybody struggling for freedom against imperialism is involved in terrorism. And anybody who supports a struggle uh, for freedom is supporting terrorism. See? So they wiped out all memories that people have of revolution. And then when they did that, it was an act that supported counter-revolution. Not just in general terms, but in our own communities. That's how Wilson Good got there. Wilson Good never would have been able to be a person of any sub substance in our community uh, without the attack on the movement. What did I mean the attack on the movement? I'm talking about the attack. They raided the Panthers in 1972, and I think I was 72 in Philadelphia. Where they brought them all out and had the press standing there to take their pictures while they were naked. They stripped them naked so they could demoralize our community and say, this is what you got standing for you. That was a part of war that was made against the revolution. The media participated, every sector, every reactionary sector, every non-revolutionary sector participated in that. The school system, the draft boards sending people to die in Vietnam and to kill for them and things like that. The whole thing was working against the revolution. Then they put these uncle, these Negroes in power, just like they did in Kenya. When the Kenya Land Freedom Army rolled up, glorious rebellion against an England that bragged about the sun never setting on this empire. At a time where England controlled, up until the 1940s, England itself, this tiny rock, this cold, barren, hostile rock, controlled 25% of the world's population and 25% of the territory of the world. That's how England became wealthy. And it was the King of Land Freedom Army called Mau Mau that rose up against the British and fought them a most serious struggle that almost ruined the empire. And, uh, and after, of course, they were able to successfully, and, and listen to me, I know the only vision that we have about those tea sipping, uh, <laughs> and, and sippage uh, 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 people who, who live in England, you know, uh, uh, is uh, Big Ben, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, the rest of that, the bobbies, you know, with the funny hats, the pigs that wear, you know, funny comical hats. But the, 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 the things that they did to us, they're unspeakable, many of them. The terror that they waged against Africans in trying to put down the resistance of the King of Land Freedom Army. They count the entire communities of people to take women and put snakes and, and banana leaves in their vaginas, to take men and do the same thing and putting snakes and, but snakes and banana leaves in their rectums. This is what the British did. This is what those tea sipping people that you can see on television now that you don't control, right? Uh, the, the wars that they waged against us were horrific. But you don't have any memory of that. They, 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 they killed those people, and then after they, after they got rid of the King of Land Freedom Army, they went to jail and got a guitar, got this, uh, this uh, Negro, uh, 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 Joe O'Kinnell, uh, who, uh, who was a liberal, uh, and brought him out, put him out of jail, brought him out of jail, and then made him the president. And they had to make him the president because it was clear that the masses were no longer going to accept uh, open white domination anymore. So they had to disguise their domination. That's what Nkrumah called neocolonialism, white power and black face. And so they got Nkrumah, but they could, and they got uh, Kenyatta. But they couldn't put Kenyatta out there as long as the Mau Mau was alive. They had to kill the Mau Mau to be able to put Kenyatta up there. And in Philadelphia, they had to wipe out the Black Panthers before they could put 
another and, and, and Wilson Good up there. And there are a lot of people who pass themselves off as leaders today but can only do so as a consequence of others having been murdered and the resistance being wiped out. There's no way in hell that Barack Hussein Obama could be president of the United States if they had not wiped out the revolutionary movement in this country. I mean, what I mean is that there's no way in hell that Barack Hussein Obama could have walked through this country yes. and much of the world yes. without having to speak to the question of Africa. It wouldn't be just a handful of people in Gibbs High School saying, what about the black community? The black revolution was set in terms. Wouldn't be, if not, if not Obama, who? So they wiped out the memory of the revolution and we've been stuck for a long time in this place where people understand being involved in the movement is sitting in front of a computer screen liking this, <laughs> <laughs> posting that. <laughs> and that's, that's more or less the extent of their involvement. A movement uh, in, the fa in the face of this, this defeat all kinds of rot and the actionary has struggled to substitute itself for revolution. People have uh, been involved in, uh, have come to the conclusion that the most important thing is the culture. No, we got to do the culture. That's, that's the way forward. If we just tie in the black culture thing, we just go back to our roots, you know, uh, uh, that'll be enough. And culture is important. But that ain't the way. That's not the leading. That's not the determining factor of what we're going to do, where we're going to be. You understand? Because, because as much as we love culture, and culture, you know, you can recognize it. You can recognize African culture almost any place you see it anywhere in the world, even though they might call it stuff, That's call right. it by other names. Right. You know it's yours when you see it, when you hear it, when you feel it. You've got it. That's yours, and that's, that's critical. But culture itself, is born of material reality, material relationships that people are engaged in while in the process of creating and recreating real life. Right. You got one culture where nature is kind. You, you develop in a place, civilization develops in a place where nature is kind. And you're not always struggling against the elements and struggling against each other to have enough in order to, to survive. You got one kind of culture. If you got that kind of culture, you got time to learn how to play the drums, right? right? You have a relationship with nature that's not hostile. You have a relationship with your neighbors because you don't have to worry about somebody stealing everything that you got. Right. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to steal everything that they got, right? <laughs> but if in other kinds of circumstances where nature is hostile, it breeds, it develops a different kind of culture, a different kind of worldview, a different kind of outlook on everything. I don't know how many of you, especially uh, if uh, those of you who come from Europe and, and some of the other places where people may be participating in this meeting are, are aware of, familiar with this, this whole story that I grew up with, the, 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 the story of telling this deep moral of the, the ant and the grasshopper. Anybody remember a story like that where the ant was always hard working and always working and storing everything that it needed in order to survive? And the grasshopper was just always playing the fiddle, fiddle and running around and enjoying itself. And the ant would warn, okay, Mr. Grasshopper, the winter's going to come. When the winter comes, I'm going to have everything that I need to survive. And you're not going to have anything, and I'm not going to give you anything, right? I learned this when I was in elementary school. And sure enough, when the winter came, uh, the grasshopper had nothing. And the ant didn't give him anything. And what I was supposed to understand from that, the moral was that you have to work really hard and store stuff and keep it for yourself so that you can survive when everybody else isn't. But what I got out of that was how in the hell can the ant be so cruel? You know what I'm saying? How can the ant be so cruel? That he knows the grasshopper's dying. He's saying, I'm not going to give you. He's got enough, et cetera. That was the lesson I got. And it's, it's a statement about one kind of culture versus another kind of culture. And, the, and we come from circumstances going back millennia. I'm not just talking yesterday. I'm not talking about what you see happening in Somalia or some other place because of desperation that has been imposed on us by imperialism. I'm talking about going back millennia, which is where your culture and your sensibilities begin to emerge and develop and consolidate. 
This is based on material reality that you are confronted with. Based on what we have to do as human beings in order to produce and reproduce a life. That is the thing that shapes and informs our culture. Our culture is informed by our material relationship and not the other way around. Culture is not, doesn't tell, doesn't say what our material reality is going to be. Our material reality says what our culture is going to be. And that's the thing that we to So, so if, if, if culture is related to the question of being able to produce and reproduce real life, what we are confronted with as African people, the reality that we have a situation where people in Sierra Leone, as an example that we use all the time. I have a lifespan, uh, I think that the average lifespan is something like 37 in Sierra Leone, right? What that means is that we are not producing real life for ourselves. We're not reproducing real life for ourselves. That's what it means, but in Sierra Leone, guess what? Some of the best diamonds in the world, you can find them in the mall, Wherever you live in some urban imperialist center, you will find some of the best. They come from Sierra Leone. The, the gold, it comes from Sierra Leone. It comes from other places in Africa. The Hershey bars that you buy in the, in the, in the market, they come from places like Ghana and Ivory Coast and the cocoa beans that made them. But the people there living off $2 at, least, at minimum, at, at most, $2 a day. What it means is that we are not produce, producing life for ourselves, but we are producing life. We are producing life for somebody else and for a social system at our expense. And then it has to stop. So when we talk about culture, we're talking about being able to read into history, to be able to go back into history, to be able to produce life for ourselves. Isn't that right? And how do we do that? We do that through revolutionary means, through the struggle to overturn the social system that takes our lives, that functions as a parasite at our expense, and to create a new system. And so the point is that what we have to see is that we have to be a revolutionary organization. And culture must serve the function of supporting and promoting the revolution. I remember when Emory Douglas was a revolution was a revolutionary. I think it was he that once said that the responsibility of a revolutionary artist is to, is to influence the people to kill the colonizers. Something to that effect. I like it, if even if it's not. I can say it absolutely correctly. Right? Because uh, I wanted to say that, and I, I want to say that we are we have a, a belief in the in this revolutionary movement that we're talking about. That's, uh, I heard I was talking to uh, brother uh, Ralph Pondexter, a uh, Lynn Stewart's husband. Fuck that black power fish, man. All right. Yeah. Pointer, pointer, pointer. No, you know who Pondexter was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know you know who Pondexter was, don't you? Yeah, yeah. He was with Angela when she was picked up. Yeah, Angela Davis when we thought she was revolutionary. That's not. Nice. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Angela said, well, "How can you? How can you? How can you be a revolution if you don't have any place to live?" <laughs> we said, Angela. You make the revolution because you don't have any place in it. I was talking to Brother Pointer, and uh, he, he, we were talking about how it's necessary to recognize the connection between uh, uh, what is happening, you know, uh, in places uh, in the so-called Arab world and Muslim world, uh, or wherever it is, and here and other places. And, and the thing is, it's not just uh, some kind of, uh, not just a kind of connection, but what we have to understand, what our party understands, what African internationalism has taught us, is that we didn't just have uh, 
the European community going through these stages of development like the Marxists talk about where, you know, they had, what, where they, they fancied there was this, this uh, primitive communism that they fancied was a general state, and you can't find it generalized, you can't find the primitive communism, they, what they call primitive communism in different societies, but you don't find it generalized any place, any time in Europe, not generalized, you might find some pockets there. Uh, and then from there, according to this, uh, this uh, the basic Marxist, and I, I'm not an anti-Marx as such, because I, I've learned a lot from Marx, right? Uh, it says that from there, you know, you have what they refer to uh, uh, as a slavery, and this time we're not talking about what happened to us, we're talking about, you know, what happened to Kirk Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, this is a Spartacus thing, a movie, and then it was you know, so for everybody who, who was young enough to know how to function on the on the internet. <laughs> that, that was uh, you you would have missed that. <laughs> but there was a movie made about the Spartacus, the slave during the Roman era, who and who was the real guy who uh, uh, made a revolution. He said that's the slave. They weren't talking about us. And then from slavery. Feudalism. And then from feudalism, they do a bit of fancy work here because they say from feudalism there's this thing that they call communism in terms of the, the, the stages of development. And I believe there are such things as laws of social development. I do truly believe in that. You must believe in it too. Because there's a science to society and we must grapple with the science of society in order to find our way. Otherwise, we'll be bleeding the spooks and and uh, ooga boogaism and other kind of stuff that has no relationship to the, to the world, right? So there is a science to a society. And uh, we want to grapple with that. But then they said that this, this, this thing uh, called feudalism, and from, feud from feudalism, sorry, capitalism, uh, from feudalism to capitalism. But it said, in, uh, in every instance, they showed how, how uh, new societies were born out of the contradictions in old societies, right? New societies, new social systems, from, from what they call uh, uh, primitive communism, there comes uh, contradictions that we have with nature, and that was the primary contradiction out of which you know, comes the new society that they refer to as slavery. From that slave society comes this thing they call feudalism, and from that, capitalism. But, in order to get to capitalism, they have to go outside of the process of the, the internal dynamics of the society itself. To get to capitalism, Marx talks about this thing they call primitive accumulation of capital. This primitive accumulation, this startup of capital, didn't happen inside Europe or inside the, 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 the feudal system itself. It was, he said, it was turning Africa into a warren for the hunting of black skins, commercial hunting of black skins. He said it was the tearing of the Indians in the Americas, into the gold mines, silver mines, that was bringing up wealth that was going to Europe. It was the opium war that was made by, the United States, by, by England against China that brought all these research. This is how Europe changed. This is the birth of capitalism. But the main point that I'm talking about is they had to step outside of some kind of internal dynamics uh, uh, for, for capitalism to come into being. Now, let me tell you how to kill capitalism. I just did. But the point is, that, that something new happens because you don't have just a succession of different stages inside a particular system. When Europe attacked us, when Europe attacked the rest of the world, you didn't have any more of these single different organisms functioning uh, in tandem or uh, in some kind of uh, health discovery. You had a new organism. You had a new organism, a new process was, was born. Uh, and, and this is easy to understand if you understand anything about dialectics, because dialectics, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the relationship between processes and things. You have to understand everything in its relationship to other things. You have to understand everything in this process of coming into being and going out of existence. That's the only way you can understand anything with any, with any significance. And so what happens then, is now, with, uh, uh, when we say dialectics, we talk about a unity of opposites. You with me on that? Sure we are. <laughs> when we say a unity of opposites, we're talking about 
uh, uh, in, in life, in all processes, you have this thing. And what we mean is that a unity of opposites is when something requires, as its definition, its relationship to its opposite. For example, there could be no up without down, right? No in without out, right? Uh, no darkness without lightness, etc. There could be no imperialism without the oppressed. There could be no capitalism without the workers. The unity of opposites is what's at work. But the beginning of this whole process that we know as capitalism that Marx talked about as primitive accumulation of capital is the initiation of a whole new relationship in the world, a new process that started off by the brigandage, by the piracy, by the slavery, by the colonialism. Now you've got this parasite from Europe that's lynched on to the body of humanity. You don't have a lot of different processes. You got now one, one process. You understand? There's not many processes, it's one process. So the parasite is now lashed on to the body of humanity around the world. It requires the enslavement, the impoverishment, the theft of resources for its existence. Not many processes, one process. Which is why we are so ecstatic and enthusiastic about how things are unfolding in the world today. We understand this, even if the permanent persons who write for the Wall Street Journal uh, don't seem to get it. Even if people in Obama's cabinet don't seem to get it. That you can't fix it, Obama. You can't fix it. And the reason you can't fi fix it, they, they want to talk like the United States economy acts in isolation to the rest of the world. They're going to fix this economy. We're going to sequester or not sequester. <laughs> We're going to do all these other kinds of things. Yo, go ahead and do it in the meantime. <laughs> in the meantime, you know, you've got, uh, uh, what is the latest crisis that's just a burden when they're taking the money out of the people's bank accounts? Yeah. Cyprus. In the meantime, if Cyprus goes, Russia's money is there. Greek money is there. Greek is already one foot in the grave. Turkey is in trouble. Uh, uh, Portugal is in trouble. France is in trouble. Italy is in trouble. Spain is in trouble. Germany is going to be in trouble. That's going to be the powerhouse of the whole thing. The whole damn thing is trouble. The whole damn thing. What are we looking at? We're looking at a parasitic relationship. Not a lot of different relationships. That's why they can't come up with a solution in Washington, D.C. That's why they kind of bomb and maim and murder people in Syria as we have this discussion right now. Because this parasite requires its ability to suck the blood of all these people who are rising up and taking back their resources. China used to be a host to the parasite. I'm not calling China some revolutionary entity. We don't have problems with that problems already with China. But the point is, China now is in contention with white power for control of the whole damn thing. Uh, uh, so it's a whole really incredibly significant moment in history that we are living through. And that's why imperialism becomes more repressive every day. But it's not the same imperialism. It's imperialism that cannot even see the future. That's why in the popular culture, what do you see? Zombies. <laughs> vampire. Don't you see that? You can't turn on the television without seeing a vampire zombie movie. They have public the city sponsors, zombie walks in public parks throughout this country because they can't see the future. Uh, and, but we can see the future. We can see the future because we're not blinded by the worldview of our oppressors. We are not confused. We know that a bomb so we stand with the people of Iraq who are still engaged in struggle with imperialism. That struggle is not over. We stand with people in Egypt, Tunisia, who are trying to get rid of the rock. We stand with the people in Venezuela and throughout South America who are chasing imperialism out of there. But we have to make this revolution. Because our future as Africans require us, first of all, to recognize that we're one people. It's not like we got to be in Jamaica uh, because we thought that one day 
you know, they were going to invent uh, uh, or, or, or Trinidad the steel drum. <laughs> and we just wanted to be there because we knew we could play better than everybody else, right? <laughs> we didn't get to Guyana on a cruise ship. We didn't come to the Americas and throughout Europe and all these other places looking for a better way of life. In fact, we lost a better way of life. And we demand to have it back. Our objective is not to find a way to fit in with imperialism. That's what they require of us in Europe. To fit in. They require that of us here too. To fit in. To make white people like us. Okay, let's have a march to make white people like us. And we call it a march against racism. <laughs> Which is essentially the same thing, isn't it? So we're in a struggle, we're in a fight against racism. Now how do you know when you won? <laughs> if somebody raised the white flag and said, we surrender racism, cut the hell no. <laughs> no, we are fighting against colonialism. Colonialism is part of what gave birth to capitalism. Capitalism is the enemy that's oppressing and oppressing the vast majority of people around the world. It must go. It must be defeated. And we must be engaged in a conscious, organized effort to make it happen. Yes. That's what this meeting is about. So, culture won't do it. Revolutionary culture functions as a part of the struggle to make it happen. Superstitions won't do it. I'm sorry. Somebody's going to leave when I say this. <laughs> Superstition won't do it. We have to arm the masses of our people. Africans have to be introduced to science and to a recognition of our significance as human beings. That we have the power. That what we are struggling against is not some God-created problem for us. This problem is created by human beings. We can take it on. Society, what do you study? Society. society. Right. If you want to understand society, don't go to the Quran. You won't find society there. Right. If you want to understand capitalism, you will not find it in, in Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. We must help people. We must help our people to get away from the boogeyman. <laughs> science is what's going to free us. Science. We have to have an understanding of society itself. And we must not fear science. I know sometimes it's hard to get with that because the imperialists have used science against the people all the time. That's why we have to take it back and use science to benefit the people. And, that's, and I'm going to sit down because people have been quite courteous to me. Because <laughs> nobody's passed me a five minute or two minute. <laughs> Nobody's been lurking around with a hook <laughs> to snatch me off, and I know I've outstayed my time. But the, the African working class, who always gets left out of the picture, that's the key. That's the future. We say this because, not because we've got some romantic notion about the workers. We say this because science helps us to understand that if there is any wealth, any place on the world, in the world, it wasn't created by stockbrokers, no lawyers did it, no professors did it, any value, any wealth, any wealth was created by working people. Workers create all the damn wealth, everything, everything, everything. That's why you ought to get upset when you hear Obama and his others talking about how somebody trying to get over on the system because they're trying to make the government pay for your health care. Health care. Where the hell the government get any damn money from? Right. Now, where, the, where the government, you, you believe that they got some big printing press down in the basement where they say, okay, damn, some more Negroes want some health care. Let's go print up another several billion dollars. It doesn't work like that. If there's any value, it is value created by working people. Working people create all the damn value. And you know what? I was talking about superstition. And I want to talk about superstition because most people don't believe that superstition. It's just, man, it's just, just skin deep. They say they believe in it, but because I know people who believe that somebody, they say they believe in it. Somebody walked on the water and 
this more politics. Uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, what is it? They raise the dead. You know, they say you can do that, and and gonna come back one day, and then everybody gonna go to this great and wonderful place, right? right, right. But damn. I want to be on this. I want to, you know, you want to be a part of that, right? <laughs> and you know that if, if they can raise the dead and walk on water, and then, you know, if one day it's going to be this trumpet blows and all the dead going to come up and everybody's going to go this place, that's, damn, that's a hell of a place. But, <laughs> but, if you believe that, seems to me you can get them to pay the water bill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even people say they believe, even your preacher who say they believe in that will have your ass out there raising money to pay the mortgage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, don't, the preacher don't rely on, you know, on that. He, you get your out there, you raise that money, you got to pay that mortgage, you got the building fund, you got all those other kinds of things that happen in the real world, don't you? Where's the building fund? There's some sisters out there selling fish sandwiches in front of the church or on the corner every week. That's materialism. They, they are inconsistent to uh, philosophical idealists. They're inconsistent. They can believe it that way. They can believe when it comes to fight right. No, we can't fight right back because now God's going to come back and take the You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, they're in, we want to take science to the people. And that means, among other things, uh, come out of Shindig. What we have to do, Sister Bird, who is our wonderful, uh, <laughs> I, I forced Sister Bird to come up here with that. Oh, uh, <laughs> you're right there waving. <laughs> what we have to do, we recognize that the workers create all the value. We recognize that there's a profound contradiction in society where you have socialized production. Do you know what I mean by socialized production? Where people come socially, produce. People produce everything. Nothing is produced by just one individual unless it's a, an African sitting, you know, like on a stoop someplace in Haiti carving up this little thing. But even that, to get the wood, somebody probably else. It's a social process. Most production happens in the world. People participate in making that happen. Sometimes not even in the same city. Sometimes not even in the same country. You go to pick up something in, in, uh, in your supermarket or in your, what do you call it, stores, uh, etc. It's made in China, made some other place. It's different parts and things get created everywhere. Social production is responsible for, for the production, on the one hand. So you got social production, but then you got this profound contradiction. That which is produced socially is owned privately. Right. Right. By somebody who didn't produce right. nothing, you understand? Right. So you got social production on the one hand, then you got private ownership. Right. <clears throat> the workers created all of this. The workers collectively and socially created everything, all the value that we have. That's socialized production. Yeah. Well, if you got socialized production, then it makes sense that you should have socialized ownership, right. shouldn't you? Yeah. If you got socialized production, you have, to have socialized ownership. If we all came together to produce it, damn it, we all own it together. And if we own it together, then we collectively are in charge of the society that makes a determination about what happens to it, where it goes, whether we should have health care or not have health care. Not some bald-headed, old, white, pinstripe wearing man somewhere in England or some motley person that comes from San Francisco that tries to pose as a liberal, uh, but we are the ones who make the determination as the producers. We put out, we bet our future on the workers. Yeah. Guess what? The imperialists bet their future on the workers too. They require the working people to get off your ass and they make alarm clocks to get you up. They got, they got cell phones to call you. They got all kinds of stuff to make sure you get up on time. Go to work if there is a job for you to have to produce some more value for them. Yes. They, got, they got confidence in the But they have the brains of the working class. It's our responsibility to put the brains of the working class back in its own possession. Because here is where the power is. That's why when you look for the police department all the time, you find them in the African working class communities. Because they uh, know that at some moment you will wake up to what belongs to you. You already know what belongs to you. You, you, may not, you don't know necessarily belongs to you. You know that as hard as your mama worked, y'all ain't got nothing. And but everywhere you look over there, they all got some. And so you start to spend a little time over there every now and then to get some of that. 
that they got, you know, they call that stealing. <laughs> the fact has already happened, but we're too late. <laughs> Ain't that right? You see that today, you look at, at, at TV, they got these commercials against stealing. They call it, you know, identity, identity theft. What? <laughs> There's also to prepare the people for self-government. We've had a working class for self-government. Part of what we need to be doing in these programs that we create, we need to even create programs that help the workers to become more competent. <laughs> they don't even have to be in the revolution because they're going to run this shit when it comes down. Yeah, right. We don't want to be depending on the petty bourgeoisie, this, and they always try to corrupt and undermine every revolutionary process. Sure. So we create things. We create Time, the ability for workers to come and get skills and time. They don't, I don't care if they're going to get a job or not after. They're going, the job is going to be running this revolution. Uh, the religion is going to be after internationalism. Uh, we've been in the process now of building our own nation. We don't have no nation yet. They don't have no African American, no Black Brit, no Ghanaian. We don't have no Haitian nation. Our nation is in the process of being constructed right now. We're in the process of building our nation. It's not going to be a hyphenated nation. Right. It's going to be a nation of one Africa. One, one Africa. One, one Africa. 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 One Africa.